Welcome to the next installment in my video lecture series for International Economics. I'm Professor Guy Pascal here at Rutgers University. And in this particular video, I'm going to go over a little bit of introductory information prior to the start of International Economics here at Rutgers. Uh, first, I'd like to give a little bit of background of myself, so at least you get some idea about me as the person. I've been a faculty member here at Rutgers University since 1993, and I've taught both on the Camden and the New Brunswick campuses. Uh, I graduated from Rutgers Camden, and I graduated from New Brunswick Graduate School in Economics. And at the present time, I run my own company. I do consulting work, doing data, uh, statistical analysis, etc., uh, mainly uh, dealing with healthcare related issues. Please make sure you note that this is the first time this course is offered online. So because of this, some issues might crop up because of this. Uh, over my years of teaching, I've come to realize I do not have perfect foresight in realizing what issues students might have. And since this is an online class, I've tried to do my best to identify items that students are going to have difficulty with. And I've made a series of videos for this for the course. So make sure you realize that there are videos available in Sakai particularly that relate to the items in this particular course that I thought would help students in a video format. Uh, they are located in each of the weeks. If you go into a week, you will see that there's a sub page for videos, and they are the videos for that particular week. And also note that they represent the title generally of a particular graphical analysis that occurs. I didn't give them the number that occurs in the textbook, but the title of it. So if you have an issue with a particular bit of graphical analysis. If you look at the title, there should be a video associated with this. Just realize that there might not be a video for the particular issue that you're having. As I said, I tried my best to try to figure out what would be the items that students would have difficulty with. So it, they may not occur. And at the end of this course, I'm going to be doing an evaluation of things to improve in particular with videos to add into this uh, just from the experience of actually having students taking the course and hopefully I'll add, be adding additional videos at the end of this. So just make sure you realize this, that it's the first time this course has been offered online and that if any issues occur, it's, it's because of this fact that this has never been attempted at Rutgers Camden before. So uh, I'm not saying they will occur, but just be aware of the fact that when a course is being offered for the first time online, some issues might crop up during the semester. Uh, make sure you realize my online classes. In particular, I strive that the, my online classes are perfect substitutes for my on-site classes. That is, I cover the same amount of material for online classes that I do for on-site classes. I attempt to make them of the same difficulty, and it should roughly be the same amount of work for students. So make sure you're aware of this. I know sometimes students... Uh, opinions of online classes are they're easier than on-site classes. Just realize that in all likelihood that is not going to be the case with this course. It's going to be the same amount of work, the same level of intensity, and the same material covered as any on-site class that I teach. I want you to be aware of what my approach is, and this is important that I don't view this just as a course. I do not view this as just a course in ac uh, international economics. I also try to help students develop skills that they need to be successful in the labor force. Okay? So that is my approach doing this. So, uh, for example, for these case study forms I'm going to talk about, Later on, I very actively read these. I'm very critical of them, pointing out issues that you have with them, uh, what you need to address, and giving you an explanation as to why your approach might not be appropriate. Do not take that personally. That's just my belief of, number one, of helping students improving their writing skills. Uh, 
as a consultant and running my own company besides hiring and firing people. I deal with some large corporations and I hear from people about concerns they have about recent college graduates. And a number one concern is their writing skills that they feel that they are subpar for some newly graduated students. So make sure you're aware that I look at this from that perspective. Also realize that when I'm doing this and I run my own company, I bring that perspective into this. So in some sense, sense I, I'll be viewing this as people, the students being my employees, that these people are working for me and I go that approach. Uh, hopefully this will help you gain some skills that will be directly applicable in the labor market, that you'll be able to distinguish yourself from other recent graduates and hopefully will be able to, that will allow you to be more successful in the future. So just be aware of that, I don't I want to say my dual role, but the fact that I own my own business and I'm an entrepreneur, bringing some of that knowledge into the course and into the I would say classroom for this course and to help people develop skills that are make them more marketable. Again, don't take offense that if I point out things to you, I've had in the past where students uh, got very upset when I pointed out their shortcomings, especially when it relates to writing. And I'm not doing it to upset you personally. I'm just trying to help you improve your skill set. So make sure you're aware of that. Also, with regards to the syllabus, realize that this gives the information about how the course is run, the policies and procedures for the course. So make sure you read it and understand it. It has all the information. I'm just giving some additional elaboration here. But make sure you read and understand it. You are responsible to know what is on the syllabus. This is important because if you realize how many students ask me questions that have already been answered on a syllabus, you'd be quite surprised at how this occurs. And again, this is, this is the entrepreneurial side of me, the business owner side of me coming out. Realize, for example, if your direct supervisor gave you a four-page document outlining what they expected you to do over the next 15 weeks, and you were constantly asking them questions that had already been answered on those instruction sets, that direct supervisor would quickly tire of the fact that you didn't bother to read this, that those instructions and were bugging them for answers that had already been, with questions that had already been answered. Make sure you pay attention to the information, but especially uh, there's a section on deadlines, you can, how you ex uh, request an extension, late penalties, etc. Make sure that you're aware of this and you understand this. The syllabus also contains a detailed schedule of the weeks uh, that we are in session, what homeworks, quizzes, case study forums, tests, etc. are due for that week and when they open and when they close. So make sure you spend the time to read through the syllabus and understand what is expected of you. The syllabus also has other pieces of important information, office hours, um, things about the homeworks, the quizzes, and the test information, how much weight each assignment, the assignments have, the homeworks, quizzes, and case studies and tests, etc. And it also outlines some things from Rutgers like disability statements, uh, where you can turn to if you need technical help with Sakai or My Econ Lab. So make sure that if you do have a question, make sure it's not answered on the syllabus. The case study forms, make sure that you understand this. I, I decided that for this course, I'm going to try to merge the forums that you normally have in a class with elements of a case study. So these are mini case studies in a forum uh, format. So realize I'm trying this out to see how it particularly works in this course. Realize that they are case study forms, so you have to put in some research. And also make sure you spend time writing your posts. Uh, I would recommend that you write the post offline and also make sure that after you write them, you read your own post critically to make sure that they make sense 
uh, that there's no typographical errors, et cetera. So make sure you put in the appropriate amount of time. The case study forms make up 15% of your grade. So remember, 15% of your time should go to all of these uh, case study forms are five of them, so realize that you know three percent of your time for the entire course should be put uh, into these case study forms. So make sure you do the research, do some uh, do some net searches to get the information, then sit down offline, write your post, then go through and analyze and and critique yourself. It's it's an important thing to do. That's a skill I think many. Uh, students lack today. They write something immediately and post it without really reviewing it or critically evaluating what they write. So make sure you spend that time doing that. Also realize that the case study forms themselves are graded holistically. I take a look at how much time and effort I think you put into it, uh, how well you addressed the instructions, did you follow all the instructions, did you put the appropriate material in? How well written is it? Are you writing things in here that are opinion, that you don't have any facts to back them up? Are you writing things that adhere to economic theory? Or are you writing things that run counter to economic theory? So make sure you realize that I do spend a significant amount of time reading them and critically evaluating them. Also realize that after I do that, I will, you will be given a grade for the case study forum, but that's not your final grade. All right, you can go in and address any of the comments or questions that I have or concerns about your post. And after you repost information or repost that, an updated version of your post, I will reread that and I will make adjustments to your grade to do that. Just make sure you keep your original post and, I, and then if you, for example, I tell students sometimes maybe it's a better idea to actually put, uh, to type it up in Word or another document and save it as a PDF file and upload it as a PDF file. I will read that. Uh, if I ask you, if I have comments, make sure you post another one. We have the original post with the original work. Post the uh, and the entire document with the changes that you made, incorporating my comments, questions, or suggestions to improve, improve your grade. Also realize that you should do this earlier in the week. Uh, I recommend you do not post on a Sunday uh, for the case study forums. I have a turnaround time of 48 hours. I've told you that I will get back to you and you will find out in 48 hours, which means if you post these on a Sunday, in all likelihood, I will not read it before the forum closes. And therefore, whatever grade you get then is the grade you get for the case study forum. So make sure you're aware of that and leave enough time when you post it for me to read it give you feedback, and then give yourself enough time to repost information to improve your grades. I recommend that you post the case study forms no later than Friday night. If you post them any later than that, there is no guarantee that I will read them and grade them and give you a grade before the you're able to make any adjustments to that. So make sure you're aware of that and take advantage of it. If you wait till Sunday night at 11 p.m. to post a case study for them, uh, you're not going to get this feedback loop that you need to improve your grade. So be aware of that. Also note that there can be a little bit of variability in the weekly workload. Uh, I attempted to try to make each of the weeks roughly the same amount of work, the same level of intensity, but for purposes of continuity and incorporating the case study forms, it was really close to impossible to do this. By continuity, I mean I really dislike, for example, in one week doing chapter seven and then half of chapter eight. I just find that sometimes the students find that confusing. If I just say do chapter seven and do chapter eight, it's well known what is expected of you. So make sure you're aware of that. I have made a note in the syllabus, particularly about weeks that are going to be on average of a higher level of work and a higher level of intensity. These are weeks one, two, six, seven, and 12. Uh, I identified week one, number one, because it is a six-day week. The semester doesn't start until a Tuesday, so you've got one less day to do the work. On top of that, you're responsible for reading the syllabus, 
There are some videos that you can watch about Sakai and this introductory video that are going to take up your time. So even though in terms of the intensity or the tech, uh, it's not very technical, the fact that we have one fewer day in this week and there's a number of things that you have to do with that are, are why I identified it. Week 2, 7, and 12 are of particular difficulty. And I want you to be aware of that so you can plan accordingly. You should know this ahead of time. Uh, chapter 2 includes two very important chapters that are vital to understanding the economic theory of international trade and why international trade occurs. So make sure you're aware of that. Week 7 and 12 are also of slightly higher levels of intensity than on average. So make sure you're aware of that. It's in the syllabus. If you go into the syllabus in the appendix at the end, I have a detailed schedule. These weeks are highlighted in red, so make sure you're aware of this. Make sure you know this. You can plan so you know what is occurring. Also realize that because of this, that there, I, can, I have some flexibility with the, the, the assignment opening date and time. All right. In particular, in talking about week one, if you sign up for my Econ Lab before the semester starts, I will open up week one early. Uh, the earliest I will open it is the Saturday before the semester starts, so you can actually start working on week one over that weekend and on that Monday before the semester starts. I would recommend that you actually do this because if you finish week one early, and complete all the work for week one, you can then request that week two be opened up early. All right? So I've already told you that week two is going to be very intense. So if you plan ahead and get week one done early, you can email me, request that I open up week two early for you, and it will occur. Same thing for these other weeks here. All right? So for example, week five, we have a test. If you decide that you want to finish that up and you finish it up on a Friday and you complete uh, your testing on Friday, you can email me and say, can you open up week six for me early so I can get a jump start on it? I will more than gladly do that for you. And if you were, uh, finish that week early, you can open up week seven. So make sure that, that you know that this, that's available to you. This really only pertains to these the weeks before these high intensity weeks. So make sure you're aware of that and take advantage of it if you decide to do so. Homeworks and assignments. Make sure you realize that the homework questions can be attempted three times. The way I've set up the homework assignments is that if you get a question correct, it locks it and you've, you've gotten it correct. If you get something incorrect, you can go back and do that question again. And if you still get it wrong, you can do it a third time. So make sure you realize that, that after you work through a homework assignment, you can go back and rework anything that you got wrong and attempt to approve your score on the homework questions. The maximum you can attempt each homework uh, question is three times. For the quizzes and tests, you can take a quiz twice and you can take a test twice. All right, so make sure you're aware of that. I know I've had students in the past at the end of the semester, oh, I didn't know I was allowed to take it multiple times. Well, it's on the syllabus. I'm telling you here. Make sure you avail yourself of that and make sure you allot yourself enough time. Okay, so realize with the quizzes and tests, one of the things that you can do is there's a review mode. You can go in and review the test and it'll show you what you got right and what you got wrong. And it will also allow you to go in and there's a functionality in my econ lab that allows you to help me solve this. So, for example, this is available with your homework questions while you're working on them. So if you're working on a homework assignment, this functionality will be available to you while you're working on it. The quizzes and tests, this functionality is not available while you're doing it, but it's available in review mode. So what I recommend, since you have two times, twice, you can take each quiz and test, that after you finish your quiz, go back and review the items that you got incorrect. Okay? and use that help me solve it function or the other things that come up in a drop down menu that will help you go over those concepts before you retake uh, the quizzes or the tests. I think this is a good way of reviewing and, and improving your scores. This is just a screen capture of what I'm talking about. 
So if you're working on the homework, this will be available. There's a question help menu. If you click on that, these are the items that come in a drop down menu. Help me solve this is very helpful for problems where there are multiple steps. This does not come up for every single problem. For example, if it's a multiple choice question about a definition, this is not going to come up. This is more to do with things that you, for questions that are actual problems. But this is very helpful because one, it reviews concepts that you should know in order to answer the question. And then it helps you step by step by saying solve this, solve A, and then it asks you to solve B, and then C. And it works you through what you need to solve in order to answer that question. You can click on this and this automatically brings up the e-text. It brings you up to the section of the particular chapter that is relevant to that particular problem. This is one of the reasons why I tell students to get the e-text and my Econ Lab access together because while you're working on a problem and if you don't, are not sure how to do it and you want to reread a particular chapter, uh, a portion of a chapter, if you click on this, this automatically brings up the section of the uh, textbook or that particular chapter that you need to read in order to answer that question. The grapher is just, I look at this as an online item if you have a graphical question that you have to answer, that you can work on it offline, not actually answering the question, so you can physically try to work out what your graph should look like ahead of time. Also, here's an Ask My Instructor. If you click on this, uh, you, I will be given a link to your particular problem and you should write in very specifically what you don't understand. But make sure you go through the help solve me this, help me solve this particular uh, problem before asking the instructor. I have found most students find this incredibly helpful because it works you through step by step. If these two aren't helping you, you can email me a question, it will email me a copy of it, but make sure you explain in detail what you're having difficulty with. All right, if you email me and say, well, I don't know how to do this problem, that's, I, I, it's difficult for me to help you do that. You have to be very specific about what you don't understand, what to do with that problem. And also know you could print a copy of that particular question out if you so desire. So make sure you're aware that for homework problems, this menu is available while you're working on it. For the quizzes and tests, this button is only available in review. So when you're, after you take your quiz or test for the first time, go through, look and review the problems that you got wrong. Use this, use these drop down menus to try and help you figure out how, what you need to know in order to answer that particular problem. Also note that there is a study plan that is in my econ lab. And uh, let me just explain to you how the study plan work, works. It uses information about questions you got incorrect on the homeworks, quizzes, and tests. So what it really does is it tries to identify the issues you're having problems with and then directs you to work on problems to help you improve your knowledge about those particular concepts. So it's individualized for each student. Make sure you realize that. So the study plan is not a study plan for the class. It's a study plan for you. Now, realize this, that this is not a concrete part of your grade, all right? And I like to have students have their own flexibility as to whether or not they use it. I've talked to students who told me that they found this incredibly helpful, and I talked to other students who said that it really didn't help them. So I don't want to tell students to use this. I would attempt to use this on your own just to try it out to see if you find it helpful, and if you do find it helpful, then use it. In particular, uh, at minimum, I would use this in concert with the tests. So after you take your test, I already told you to go into review mode and use the help me solve this drop down menu to work on the problems that you got incorrect so you can improve your knowledge and hopefully improve your score. Also, <coughs> excuse me, also you might want to use the study plan in concert with that. And in particular, for example, if you go through the questions that you got wrong, if you notice that it's in a, you, the questions you got wrong are centered in a particular chapter or a couple of sections in a chapter, work the study plan for the sections of that chapter. All right. I wouldn't recommend that you use the study plan for all that is covered on that particular test. 
but I would use it in unison with reviewing the questions you got wrong and make a note of where those questions occur. And generally, for example, if it says chapter two, question 3.1, that's telling you it's chapter two, section three. And it's a question that's the first question from section three. So if you notice that there's a particular section or sections from a chapter that you had difficulty with, make sure you review your test, review your quiz, use that drop down menu of help me solve this. And then on top of that, use the study plan just for the particular chapters that most of your issues were related to. Also, I expect students to engage in professional correspondence. This has to do with emails and also that ask your professor or ask the professor button that is in the help me solve this or, you know, the, the things that are that drop down menu that can come up. Make sure you're, you're, you engage in professional correspondence. The reason why I tell you this is generally you should always assume a higher level of formality in any correspondence as, as a rule. Because if you assume a lower level of formality, you might upset the person that you're sending the email to. They might be offended by the fact that you've gone to the informal tense versus a, a formalized approach to writing the email. And in particular, if this is, since this is an international economics class, I know particularly with my dealings for people from other countries, other countries are much more formal than people in the United States. All right. But especially when it comes to business. All right. Let me give you an example. Sometimes I get emails from students that start off with, hey, H-E-Y. That would not fly if you were dealing with somebody from a company in Germany or in Asia or anywhere. All right. They would be very offended that you jumped into something that informal immediately. So generally what I tell students is that you should always be more, use the formal first. And then in generally in business uh, environment, the other individual will signal you that you can use a lower level of formality. All right, I, I deal quite frequently with people from Germany, and they will use the formal tense with you. So they will be formal. But once they drop that formal tense, so for example, they might say, they, they will always refer to you by your professional name. So it will be Professor Pascal, or, you know, Mr. Sir, or whatever. All right, but once they feel comfortable with you, they might call you by your first name which means you can call them by your first name. So they, they, you know, be, mostly I'm telling this because this is an international economics class and I have some experience in dealing with people and uh, interacting with people from other countries. And that's one of the things they tell me when they deal with people from the United States that we lack a certain level of formality. So make sure you'll be aware of that. And also if you email me, be specific about your issue. I, I can't tell you the number of times students t email me and would say, I don't understand the standard trade model. Well, I can't really help you because the standard trade model is an entire chapter in the book. Now, if you could be more specific, I was up okay up until this point, and I'm having difficulty with this particular concept. So make sure that if you're sending me an email, if you're using the function, uh, that drop-down function and then the, the drop-down menu of ask your professor or ask the professor, make sure you're specific about what your issue is. If you email me and, and the, if you send me this ask the professor uh, for help thing and you say, I can't, I don't understand how to do this. I have no starting point with which to help you. So be specific. If you don't understand, try to explain the issue that you're particularly having. Also note, I, I spoke about this earlier, I have created videos, they are all located in Sakai. They are located in the resources section, but they're also located in the weeks tab. So if you're in week two, at the bottom you should see that there is a sub page with videos. Realize that these are dealing mostly with graphical concepts. My experience with this course is that these are the types of things that students have difficulty with and a video exposition on them can be very helpful. In particular, what I have noted is that with a textbook you have a static diagram. And oftentimes four or five things have occurred in sequence and all you get to see is the end result of that. So students see that ending of what the graphical analysis looks like 
and they have difficulty visualizing step by step how it got to that point. So the way I approach it is I build it up. Instead of showing you the end point, here's what the graph looks like after four things. I start at the beginning and illustrate all the different things that occur and how it impacts the graph and explain what is actually occurring with that graph. So students generally have found that to be uh, quite helpful in my other classes that I've done videos for. Also note that you know, you're not really required. There's no way I can judge whether or not you watch the videos and how well you understand them. All right. The videos are there for you if you're having difficulty. All right. If you read the textbook, do the homework, do the quizzes and tests and are doing fine, there's really no reason for you to watch the particular videos. Also realize that if you are having issues, go take a look at the videos. The videos are are named exactly as the graphs in the chapters are named. All right. So if, for example, I have my managerial economics book here, but you know, if it says figure 9.6, natural monopoly, uh, this is just coming from my uh, managerial economics class. Uh, it won't, the video won't be labeled figure 9.6 because that sometimes can change from uh, version to version, but it will say natural monopoly. So if you're having problem with a particular graph or a particular series of graphs, sometimes I incorporate two or three of the graphs together in one video. So just realize that, that look for the title. If you see a, a, um, a, graph, a graph that's in the textbook and you're, and you're having issues with it, look at the title and then match that to a title that is in the, uh, the description of the actual video. Also, during the semester, what I do is I run reports on how students did on particular problems. And if I notice in a particular week that there is a question that a good portion of the class was unable to answer, uh, what I do is I do an analysis of the questions that were asked. I generally identify a couple, and then I make a video related to that. Please note that this might not happen every week. In the first week, I, I can't imagine this happening. There's not too much difficult material in the first week. But in week two, if there's question, if I look through it and notice a couple of questions that the class in, the enti in, their enti in its entirety had, I will make another video related to that and make that available to students so you can look at that before the, the upcoming test. So just make sure that you realize that uh, the videos I have are going to be augmented by questions from my econ lab that students had particular problems with. Also realize that the final exam is pro, uh, optional. You will receive a provisional grade at the end of week 14. You will receive a letter grade and this will be in Sakai. If you're happy with that, you don't have to take the final exam and what happens, your provisional grade is your grade for the course. If you decide that you want to take the optional final to improve your grade, remember that the optional final gets incorporated into your test grade. Okay? So instead of three tests being 45%, four tests are 45%. So make sure you're aware of that. And also, when you're determining whether or not you want to take the test, realize that you have to outperform the average of your three tests on the optional final to have any chance. So that is the point. So for example, if you've got an 80 on the first three tests, you're going to have to improve your grade above that 80 to have any opportunity to improve your grade for the course. Also realize that there's risk and reward involved with this. That means, for example, if you had an average of an 80, on the first three tests and you decide to take the optional final and you get a 70 out of your best ones, you could potentially lower your grade. So make sure that you're aware of that. It's a risk. You're not guaranteed of improving your grade by taking the optional final. Also realize that the optional final is cumulative and it is a true final exam. All right. So it is longer than the tests and it covers more material than the test. So make sure you realize that the optional final is a true cumulative final exam. So make sure you're aware of that. 